across the state is she said, why don't you do a little beginner's thing for us? So I know there's some people in here that will probably be snoozing pretty quickly because this is pretty basic stuff. And she asked me to maybe talk an hour and a half. Uh, hopefully we can keep it under that. No. <laughs> so, well, anyway, that's what I'm planning. I don't know what you really want me to do. Uh, I can do anything. Uh, that seemed like a long time late at night, but uh, we'll do what we can. Generally, you like to do workshops. Workshops, you like to be on hand. So you like to be a day and a half in the bee yard with them. And we like to do that in the springtime, so this is really not a good time to be doing this kind of thing. However, this is one way to do it, um, especially when you have to cover a lot of- Could you talk to the little bit? Sure. I'm having a hearing problem. Sure. So anyway, um, this is really not a workshop, but it's basically gonna tell you a little bit about how to get started beekeeping. That'll be the first set. We'll talk a little bit about equipment, and then we'll talk a little bit about seasonal management, uh, and leave it at that. There's, you know, anybody who's kept bees, some of these guys, Tommy's kept bees for at least 20 years or more. Um, you could talk about bees all night if you wanted to. Now, one thing I forgot to make copies of is information about the State Beekeeping Convention. I really forgot, uh, but I need to go ahead and tell you about it. Uh, the date of our annual Mississippi Beekeepers Association annual convention is November 15th and 16th. That's a Friday and a Saturday. It's a day and a half. It'll be in Tupelo at the Clarion Inn and Summit Center. If you want more information, I did put my business card out at my out. Uh, you can send me an email and I will send you the registration forms and the information. And, and I almost finished the program for the meeting. Um, so send me an email and I'll send you the information about that. So again, November 15th and 16th and uh, in Tupelo. So anything else have I forgotten? That's the main thing I forgot to make copies of. Okay, so let's just start off with how to get started in beekeeping. And um, this year, I actually, I'm fairly new to Starkville. I've only been there about a little over a year. So I actually had to go through this. I bought 92 colonies this year, started 92 colonies this year, uh, much the same way you might start a colony that I'll talk about here. Um, I'm gonna give you some advice that you often see in books, and I'll tell you where I depart from that a little bit, but most of this is pretty standard beekeeping uh, 101. They like you to start with brand new equipment, and here's the problem with that. Anybody look and price woodenware, milled woodenware these days? Not cheap. So to, to start a hive, you'll need a bottom board, at least two brood chamber boxes, probably two supers, and a top, and frames. And by the time you do that, how much money have you spent? Between three and $400. Right. I was gonna turn the lights down, but I may have turned, but you may have to restart. Have oh to yeah, you out. shot the system, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then you have to buy the bees. So you have to either buy a nuke, which this last year, what was the average price of a nuke? 125. About 125. Hmm. And that, that's with a queen. And if you buy packages, I don't know what packages cost anymore because I couldn't find anybody that would sell them or locally. Uh, you can buy them from across the country, but then you gotta pay shipping. And then queens are averaging anywhere from 25 to $32, dollars, depending on who you buy from. So it's not cheap to do it commercial Langstroth way. Now there's another type of beekeeping that I'm not even going to talk about called top bar beekeeping. And the reason I don't talk about that with beginners is there's no commercial support. There's very there's a handful of people that do it regularly in the U.S. More and more people are trying it. And one, there are two reasons they're trying it. Hmm. Please wait. Okay. One, they can build the high bodies for 25 bucks. Okay. And then two, it's a different kind of beekeeping. The kind of beekeeping we do, the, the hive grows vertically. Yeah. And anybody that's taken honey super off when it's about this high up and it weighs 60 pounds or, or more knows the pain involved there. The top bar hive grows horizontally. And if you're smart, you put it about waist high so you're never bending and it's really better on the back. But there's some disadvantages. When you, when you harvest honey from a top bar hive, you actually destroy your combs. That's a disadvantage. So I won't even talk about top bar beekeeping, but all I want you to know is there is an alternative to what is called, this is the Langstroth Beehive, movable frame hive. There are all alternatives out there. 
But this, if you start with this kind of equipment and this style of beekeeping, a lot of people keep bees this way. You can get help when you need it. If you have a problem, people can help you with manipulations. You want to try and start with new equipment because we have diseases in bees. Just about any livestock you raise have diseases. Bees are no exception. They get bacterial diseases. They get mites. They get fungal diseases. And some of these diseases can be transmitted in the equipment, in particular the combs they live in. So if you buy nooks, for example, you can buy diseases. And this year was a great example. <clears throat> I bought 92 bee colonies. I didn't sample them for varroa mites, even though I know I was probably buying mites. I thought I'm certainly going to have time to sample them in end of August, early September. In four months' time, I already lost 20 colonies to the mites, so I bought a lot of mites from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the cost. Of it. And those, so I bought all my bees in nooks, and we'll talk about what that is in a minute. But basically what that is is a small colony that already exists in combs. So I bought a lot of roa mites from one guy, and they did well in my colonies. In four months, <laughs> I had really sick to dying colonies, 20 of them, 20 out of 92. <clears throat> I thought I'd have more time because I thought nobody's going to have that many mites. Wrong. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about the cost. This is just sort of some advice. Um, a lot of people in the South in particular, we, we have different sizes of boxes. This is the standard one we call D. This is the tallest box. And a lot of beekeepers, when I was growing up, the mantra was, you keep the brood chamber, which is where the queens and baby bees are going to live, in two deeps. Okay? Some people don't like that. They want one deep and one medium. It just depends. And some people have all medium equipment. It doesn't really matter, but the queen is going to occupy a volume, something like that. Whether it's in two deeps or three mediums, it's up to you. Whatever your back likes. Now, you're not going to need three or four honey supers your first year, unless it's a really good year. But it's nice to have it ready. The worst thing in beekeeping is to have a colony that's really growing fast and you don't have any space to give it for the honey that they're bringing in. And then they swarm because you're not managing their space well. So even though you may not need three or four honey supers, now let me just explain for those who are very brand new. The boxes in the bottom of the colony are where the queen lives and raises brood. We call that the brood chamber. Anything placed above that is called a super. And it's basically where the honey, harvestable honey goes. So that's some of the jargon. You should have, if you don't have any handouts, I do have a handout on beekeeping <coughs> jargon to help you. Uh, you can make sure that you get passed around again so everybody gets, gets some. So that's sort of the early recommendations. <coughs> so let's talk about some issues. Um, the hardest thing to learn in, in beekeeping when you first start is apiary location. What are the things you need to think about? One is sheltering them from wind, or in some cases, drift from insecticide. Um, these are actually colonies in the delta, and these trees have helped protect them from exposure to insecticides by aerial applicators and soybeans. Not only that, those trees protect them from the oncoming winds in the wintertime. So when possible, if you know where the prevailing winds are, especially in the wintertime, put your bees on the other side of a tree, tree line as a windbreak. It really helps them out in the wintertime. Although, down here, it's not a very harsh winter, if you want to call it that season down here. It's not very harsh. This is the pesticide drift I was telling you about. The same beekeeper that had the previous apiary had this apiary less than a mile away. He didn't have it in the trees. The, the apiary you just saw was actually down this road in the trees. This is another apiary he had about 0.8 miles away. Between two soybean fields, aerial applicator was treated for tarnished plant bugs, hit his colonies, and destroyed $20,000 for the bees. Ooh. So that's the difference a tree can make. And I can guarantee you, this is soybeans here, soybeans here, and there's soybeans on the other side of these trees. I guarantee you, without those trees, those other colonies would have been exposed too, to a direct hit. So those trees save those other bees. So that's the value of tree canopy sometimes. <clears throat> Wind and other things. You've got to think about water, especially down here. When you evacuate for a hurricane, are you going to take your bees with you? The commercial guys are, but you're not. They may, even the commercial guys may not. 
This is actually after, I want to say it was Tropical Storm Allison in Baton Rouge. We lost a lot of colonies because bees are pretty good at sealing their colonies really tight with weathering uh, material called propolis. And in a storm like this, if water raises above the entrance and the colony is sealed really tight, they'll suffocate. We lost a lot of bees just to suffocation. Because they can crawl up and get away from the water. But pretty soon with all that mass of bees in there breathing, CO2 builds up and they knock themselves out and suffocate. <clears throat> so think about water. Now anymore, I'll talk about bottom boards in a minute. Anymore, a lot of people are using screen bottom boards and that helps because there's some place for the CO2 buildup to go. If you're using a solid bottom board, one thing you worry about is rain coming in, just anytime we get rain. So notice this person has his, the back of his hive elevated, so there's always a slant to where water is going out of the colony. You do not want standing water on a bottom board. It creates stress for the bees and is basically an incubator for disease, especially diseases like chalk root, which is a fungal disease. But it really stresses bees, and it's just not good to have moisture in the hive. <clears throat> so if you saw the bottom boards in particular, make sure your hives can drain, because that front entrance ramp that they put on bottom boards can catch water, and if you've got it tilted at all, it'll slide right into the column. If you live in suburbia or near a neighbor, think about your neighbors. They're not going to be friendly about bees as you are necessarily. Now this is actually a commercial top bar hive from New Zealand. You probably pay more for that than you would for this. But it's just used to illustrate the idea. This person is using the privacy fence as a trick to make bees fly up. Once bees get up, they tend to stay up. If a bee can come out of a hive and stay hip level and fly, for half a mile, it will. She'll take the path of least resistance. So one way to keep these bees from messing with these neighbors down on the other side of the fence, and notice these roofs too, is to use the privacy fence or shrubs or something to force them up and out when they come out of their colony. And once they go already up, they have to clear this roof, so they're going to keep going up. And once they clear that roof, they're going to stay above your neighbors as they forage. So you don't want to put bees on a direct path to your neighbor's swimming pool, clothesline, where they're going to be, or children playing. Use obstacles to make them fly up and around. <clears throat> uh, this is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, no one's ever going to put bees on the side of a highway like this. But I did get a call one time from a guy. I said, Jeff, I don't know what's going on. I just, I had these healthy colonies. I just moved into this place, new place, and they're just dwindling. I don't know what's going on. There's no varroa issue. Come check it out. And he put it along a country highway, sort of like 49. <clears throat> okay? And I'm driving, and as I get near the apiary site, I hear across my windshield. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just what I told you. The bees were coming out. They had no obstacle between them and the highway. And they were staying low. And they were getting decimated by the traffic. And so all he had to do was rearrange his apiary a little bit and force the bees to fly up and high in a different way and he kept them out of harm's way. Okay, here's where you get into big debates. Because of some of the pests we have, namely the small high beetle, there's been a recommendation to put your bees in full sun. I will tell you that stresses the heck out of the bees. It stresses the heck out of the beekeeper. I'm not going to do it. Now, I work Friday with beekeepers that do, and it was really pleasant day Friday. But I reminded them that July is not, <laughs> and they said, we don't work them in July. And they didn't, I'll have to say this, they have very few high beetles. And my bees, which are on the tree lines like this, have a lot of high beetles right now. So it's absolutely right, okay? But I don't worry so much about high beetles. And <laughs> I have a different attitude than a lot of people. And I'll talk about that later. I think strong colonies can handle the high beetle. And people overreact and do a lot of crazy things to handle this critter. Um, but... At two in the afternoon, I want to be under shade. I don't want to be standing in the full sun. So it's, it's your preference. If you worry about high beetle, that sun thing really works. But if you worry about your own health and passing out after working 20 colonies in the full sun, don't put them in full sun. Put them where you like. Under a live oak tree where you can drink mint juleps while you work your bees, whatever. <laughs> Here's the small high beetle in case you've never seen that. This is the problem. This is a little beetle. It's about five millimeters long. 
they're attracted to all things in a beehive, the bees, the pollen, the comb, the bee larva. They layer their eggs in there, and the legs hatch out into little tiny larvae that grow up to be about an inch or so long, and they just eat their way through the hive, eat everything, and destroy the combs, and they do a rather pleasant thing. As they eat through the combs, they poop, and the poop has a slime in it, and in that slime there's a yeast that the bees are repelled by. So this little mass of wiggling maggots, like maggots, they're actually beetles, maggots are fly immatures. They look like maggots. This wriggling mass of bee larva can actually repel a whole colony of bees and force them out and they'll take over the hive and destroy it. Yeah. Destroy all the combs. So that's why beekeepers like to put their bees in full sun. It really helps cut down on the numbers. These beetles don't like it too hot. They like to be in the dark. So that's why a lot of people put them in full sun. The reason they put them in full sun is the soil around these colonies gets really heated and baked in full sun.